Welcome, I'm Martin Jonikis. I'm an engineer turned biologist. My lab at Princeton works on the structure, biogenesis, and engineering of the pyrenoid, a mysterious algal organelle that mediates a third of global CO2 assimilation. But before I tell you about the pyrenoid, I first want to share with you why I'm so excited about photosynthetic organisms more generally. Photosynthetic organisms have this incredible ability to harness energy from sunlight and use this energy to assimilate CO2 into biomass. As a result of the massive scale at which they do this chemistry, photosynthetic organisms impact nearly every aspect of our lives, ranging from regulating the global carbon cycle to making all the food we eat, most of the fuels we burn, and many of the materials we use. As you know, our civilization is facing major challenges in all of these areas in the coming decades, and it's the dream of my lab to contribute to addressing these challenges by advancing our basic ability to engineer enhanced photosynthetic organisms, such as crops that make more food with fewer resources. One of the biggest opportunities we see lies in the enzyme Rubisco, thought to be the most abundant enzyme on the planet. It catalyzes this key reaction, fixing CO2 into biomass in essentially all photosynthetic organisms. But Rubisco runs slowly, and the slow rate of CO2 fixation limits the growth rates of many of our crops, including rice and wheat. Neither we nor nature have been able to engineer a better Rubisco. But some organisms have evolved a way to make Rubisco run 10 times faster by putting Rubisco into a compartment into which they pump CO2 to a high concentration. This is called a CO2 concentrating mechanism. Eukaryotic algae, prokaryotic cyanobacteria, and a few land plants called C4 plants have each independently evolved a different molecular way to achieve such a CO2 concentrating mechanism. And there's currently a great interest in understanding how they work and in engineering them into the crops that don't have them. A lot of solid science suggests that if successful, such a transfer could increase yields by up to 60%, and the crops would require less water and less nitrogen fertilizer. Now, it's early days, and I think at this time, all of these approaches are worth pursuing. My lab has focused on understanding the algal CO2 concentrating mechanism because it offers unique engineering opportunities and is the most poorly characterized. To help you understand what we're doing, I first want to explain a major difference between CO2 assimilation in algae and CO2 assimilation in plants. In both algae and plants, the CO2 fixing enzyme Rubisco is found inside the photosynthetic organelle, the chloroplast. In a plant cell, the Rubisco is found throughout the chloroplast, and CO2 diffuses in slowly from the outside to be fixed by Rubisco. In contrast, in an algal cell, the Rubisco is clustered into a microcompartment called the pyrenoid, and CO2 is pumped from a low concentration outside the cell to a high concentration inside the pyrenoid, which makes the Rubisco run faster. I want to show you what this looks like in an actual algal cell. This is a cross-section through a single cell of our model alga Chlamydomonas, which we call clammy. The pyrenoid is this little ball which sits inside the chloroplast. Having a pyrenoid confers such a tremendous growth advantage that nearly all algae on the planet have one, including the algae that do much of the photosynthesis in the oceans, diatoms, coccolithophores, and chlorophytes. In fact, we calculate that about a third of global CO2 assimilation occurs in a pyrenoid. So this is clearly an organelle of major biogeochemical importance. And yet it's also one of the most poorly characterized organelles that we know of. If we zoom in on the pyrenoid, we can see three subcompartments. There's a spherical matrix containing tightly packed Rubisco. These little clumps are individual Rubisco holoenzymes. The matrix is traversed by a vasculature of membrane tubules, which we think deliver concentrated CO2 to the Rubisco in the matrix. And the matrix is surrounded by a thick wall, the starch sheath. When we started the lab 11 years ago, this was essentially the state of the field. The pyrenoid had remained almost completely uncharacterized at a molecular level. But if we dream of engineering a pyrenoid into crops, we first need to understand its basic molecular biology. What are its protein components and how is it assembled? In today's talk, I will first tell you how we developed genetic and protein localization tools that allowed us to discover 90 components of the pyrenoid. I will then share with you three of the most fascinating things that we've learned about the assembly of one of the compartments, the pyrenoid matrix. The matrix is liquid-like, a linker protein holds the Rubisco together, and a protein sequence motif targets proteins to the matrix. To identify components, we wanted to use a genetics approach. But at the time, progress in this field and many others was limited by difficulties with obtaining algal mutants in genes of interest. There was no mutant library. There was no effective nuclear gene targeting. Cas9 to this day is very inefficient. 
Transforming DNA integrates at random sites in the genome, and mapping of these insertions was mysteriously hard. And propagation was low throughput. Strains were propagated by hand in individual glass vials, as you can see here. To overcome these challenges, postdocs Xiaobo Li and Ru Zhang, who now each run their own labs, teamed up with our bioinformatician Veronica Patena to lead a massive effort that developed a genome-wide collection of 60,000 clammy mutants with known gene disruptions. This is a picture of several plates from our collection. In each of these colonies, a different gene is disrupted. 80% of the genes are represented. This is the first such resource in any single-celled photosynthetic organism. Over 5,000 of these mutants have been distributed to over 300 laboratories worldwide, and they're enabling advances in a broad range of fields that use CLAMI as a model system. One of the first things that my lab did with this resource was a massive screen to identify mutants with defective CO2 concentrating mechanisms. Leif Pallison, a postdoc in the lab, grew each plate of mutants under two conditions, air and high CO2. He then looked for mutants like this one, which cannot grow photosynthetically in air, but can grow under high CO2. This classic phenotype suggests a defect in the CO2 concentrating mechanism. The screen yielded a list of candidates, and we next sought to determine where these candidates localize within the cell. But at the time, it was very difficult to determine the localization of even a single protein in algae. So another postdoc in the lab, Luke Mackinder, who now runs his own lab, developed vectors and a pipeline that allowed him to tag over 100 candidate proteins from the screen and transcriptomics with the fluorescent protein Venus and determine their localization by microscopy. And we were excited to find that a number of these candidates localized to the pyranoid, which was intriguing because for the past 25 years, the pyranoid had been thought to be primarily composed of two proteins, Rubisco and Rubisco activates, which is a chaperone for Rubisco. In these confocal microscopy images, the fluorescently tagged protein is shown in green and the surrounding chloroplast is shown in magenta, visualized through chlorophyll autofluorescence. You can see that each of these tagged proteins localized to a bright punctus in a hole in the chlorophyll autofluorescence, which corresponds to the pyranoid matrix. So you can imagine that we were thrilled when we started to see other proteins that also localize to the pyranoid, like this protein, which also localizes to the pyranoid matrix, and this protein, which localizes to the starch sheath, and this protein, which intriguingly forms a mesh around the pyranoid. And my favorite, this protein, which forms a beautiful star-like pattern that traverses the pyranoid and we think corresponds to the pyranoid tubules. We then went on to do immunoprecipitations and mass spectrometry on these and other pyranoid localized proteins, and together we identified a total of 90 components of the pyranoid. The challenge now for the field is to use these pyranoid localized proteins as molecular handles to characterize the structure, biogenesis, and function of the pyranoid's three subcompartments. In the next few slides, I want to share with you some of the insights that we've gained from these tagged lines into the structure and biogenesis of one of the compartments, the pyranoid matrix. The matrix had long been thought to be a crystalline solid. This view had emerged from electron micrographs taken 50 years ago, which showed crystalline arrays of particles in the pyranoid matrix of several species of algae, like this one. However, a crystalline solid packing of Rubisco leads to a paradox about how all this Rubisco can be serviced by the much less abundant enzyme Rubisco activase, which is needed for efficient CO2 fixation. So Liz Freeman Rosenzweig, a graduate student in the lab, did a fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching experiment to determine if the matrix really is a solid. And she observed instead that the matrix mixes internally like a liquid. Here we're looking at a pyranoid that's lit up by fluorescently tagged rubisco. These images are false colored with red and white being the brightest intensities. In this experiment, we used a laser to bleach the fluorescence in half the pyranoid, producing an unevenly fluorescent pyranoid. When we watched the uh, pyranoids over time, we were surprised to find that the fluorescence homogenizes on the timescale of seconds, indicating that the matrix is mixing internally. These results and others have led us to the conclusion that the pyranoid matrix, at least in clammy, is not a crystalline solid, but rather behaves as a phase-separated liquid-like organelle, like RNA granules and nucleoli. This new view of the pyranoid changes how we've been thinking about its biogenesis and engineering. How is this liquid-like state achieved at a molecular level, and what holds the rubisco together in the pyranoid? Luke found the answer in one of the candidates that he discovered. This matrix-localized protein, which Luke named EPIC-1 for essential pyranoid component. We now have evidence indicating that this protein serves as a molecular glue that holds the rubisco together in the pyranoid. 
Some of the evidence that supports this model is based on fluorescently tagged rubisco. In the wild type, fluorescently tagged rubisco forms a bright punctus where the pyrenoid is. However, in an EPIC-1 mutant, this rubisco is now found throughout the chloroplast, indicating that, that this EPIC-1 protein is required for rubisco's normal localization to the pyrenoid matrix. Shan He, a research scholar in the lab, recently determined that EPIC-1 and Rubisco each have multiple binding sites for the other, allowing the two proteins to form a dense condensate. In collaboration with ATHMI's cryo-EM facility, Shan determined the structure of the binding interface, leading to our current model, where EPIC-1 is an intrinsically disordered protein with five evenly spaced binding sites for Rubisco, which bind to specific sites on the Rubisco holoenzyme. EPIC-1 and Rubisco bind and unbind rapidly, allowing the Rubiscos to flow past each other while staying together in a densely packed condensate. Our discovery and characterization of this EPIC-1 linker protein solves the long-standing mystery of how Rubisco is held together in the pyrenoid. And more broadly, our studies have now made the clammy pyrenoid matrix one of the structurally best understood phase-separated condensates in cell biology, making it a powerful system for studying the biophysics of biological phase separation. One of the biggest surprises came when we discovered that these Rubisco binding motifs are not present just on EPIC-1, but are also present on dozens of other pyrenoid localized proteins. Moritz Mayer, a research scholar in the lab, figured out that these Rubisco binding motifs mediate the targeting of proteins to the pyrenoid. He demonstrated that the Rubisco binding motif is necessary for targeting by taking one of these proteins, which normally localizes to the pyrenoid matrix, and he showed that mutating its Rubisco binding motif now causes this protein to localize throughout the chloroplast, demonstrating that the motif is necessary for its targeting to the pyrenoid. In another experiment, Moritz also demonstrated that the motif is also sufficient to target a chloroplast protein to the pyrenoid matrix. These results have led us to our current model where newly synthesized proteins that contain this Rubisco binding motif diffuse around the chloroplast until they encounter the pyrenoid matrix, where they're captured by binding to Rubisco. Our work has produced a detailed molecular understanding of the matrix, one of the pyrenoid's three subcompartments. But if we want to engineer a functional pyrenoid into crops, we now need to understand a second compartment, the pyrenoid tubules, which we think supply the matrix with concentrated CO2. Yet we know almost nothing about them at a molecular level. The tubules have several intriguing molecular features. At the heart of the pyrenoid, they form a reticulated network out of which the tubules radiate. The tubules cross the starch and fuse with the photosynthetic thylakoid membranes, which form sheets outside the pyrenoid. And if we take a section through a tubule, we find that inside there is a second set of membrane tubes, which are among the smallest known in any biological system, with an internal diameter of only 4 nanometers. How are the tubules made? How do they deliver CO2? Do they serve other functions beyond CO2 delivery? And how are the tubules connected to the matrix? It is my belief that answering these basic biological questions is going to make or break our ability to engineer a functional pyrenoid into crops. In summary, I've told you today that the algal pyrenoid enhances CO2 fixation. But while its existence was known for over 200 years, the pyrenoid had remained almost completely uncharacterized. We developed a widely used algal mutant library and used systematic protein localization to discover 90 components of the pyrenoid. We discovered that the pyrenoid matrix is liquid-like. We discovered a key linker protein that holds the Rubisco together. And we discovered the mechanism of protein targeting to the pyrenoid matrix. We now lead an international collaboration that aims to engineer a pyrenoid into plants with a dream of producing crops that make more food with fewer resources. To get there, we now urgently need to understand the pyrenoid tubules. Finally, I'd like to thank the members of my lab as well as our collaborators and funding sources. 